I want to talk to you this week about God's call. When God calls, we're going to look at Moses in Exodus chapter 3 and chapter 4. So in verse 1. Now Moses was pastoring the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw they turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. He said, Here I am. And he said, Do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet. The place in which you're standing is holy ground. He also said, I am the God of your father, God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Father, well, may we recognize today that we're on holy ground as we open up your word. May we recognize that your call comes to each and every one of us and our responsibility with that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, more than any other generation, we're used to answering calls. It's like we're born with a cell phone attached to our hand. If you call my phone, I don't answer. There's several reasons for that. One is you're not my list of contacts. Your name doesn't come up then. I don't know who you are, I'm not gonna answer the phone. Uh, or I may be busy doing something else, usually talking on the phone to somebody else. Or I may, I may just not want to talk to you. <laughs> Maybe that simple. The expectation is for every Christ follower is that God will be calling us. He calls us to a couple of things. First of all, he calls us to fellowship with him. First Corinthians 1 9 says, God is faithful to whom you were called in the fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. He calls us into a relationship, in the fellowship with him. He then calls us to do something. There's a task, a task that he wants us to do. The expectation is that we would answer his call, but too many of us are preoccupied with other interests, too many things on our mind, too many places we got to be, too many things we got to do. Or too busy. God's not longer. God's no longer on our contact list. Uh, we simply do not want to answer His call. To a large degree, many of us have lost contact with God. Why do we not hear from Him much anymore? Well, there's several reasons. One is we don't open up our Bibles daily. Primarily, God speaks through His Word, and when you randomly or not at all read and listen to His Word, you're not going to hear His voice and call. Another reason is that too many are not faithful in gathering with his people. When God's people congregate, he's present. And he's calling out to his people. God speaks to us individually, but he also speaks to us congregationally in, in, in fellowship with one another. And we're hit and miss with that, then we're going to miss a lot of what God wants to say to us. And then we've not done what he told us to do. When we obey, He reveals more, but when we do not respond, respond, God does not reveal more. We become stagnant. Sometimes God reveals Himself in a gentle, quiet voice. Sometimes He gets our attention in a dramatic way. I'd say a bush on fire but not being consumed is a pretty dramatic way for God to get your attention. But know some factors of God calling to us. First of all, God intervenes in the normal pursuits of everyday life. Moses is tending his sheep. Don't do anything spectacular, anything expecting un he's not expecting anything unusual to happen. We need to be ready to encounter God in everyday life. God could intervene at any moment, any time with his voice to us to what he wants us to do. Second, any place you encounter God is holy ground. God told Moses, hey, Take off his shoes because the place where you're standing is holy ground. Sign of respect and reverence for God. And we need to understand that any place you encounter God is holy ground. You cannot, you don't have to be in a church building to experience Him, but you cannot be casual in your relationship with Him and be effective in serving Him. God's not your buddy, God's not your pal. God is a holy God. God who's entered into a relationship with us by amazing grace. He's still holy and he's still worthy of all respect and all reverence for him and his name. Now, 
There's a humbling that must take place in our heart before we can be useful to our Lord. God lays out his plan for Moses. He tells him that he's aware of the cruel bondage and suffering of his people. He tells him that he's going to deliver them. He's going to lead them to a land of milk and prompt milk and honey, the land of promise. And he's going to send Moses to bring them out. This is when he really gets sticky. The man Moses, who is afraid to look in God's direction, is now afraid to is now not afraid to argue and dicker with God. He makes three basic excuses. First one is, who am I? Verse 10, Therefore come now, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But, but, the Moses said to God, Who am I? That I should go to Pharaoh, and I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt. And he said, Certainly I will be with you, and this will be a sign to you, that it is I who sent you. And you brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. There's a false assumption here. God wants important jobs done by important people. Instead, we need to know this, that God uses obedient people to do important things. Not necessarily important people to do things, but, but, but obedient people do important things. Besides that, we are incapable of knowing who's important and qualified and who's not. But God is not incapable. Moses was actually well suited for a task. He's, we know from the book of Acts that he's eight years old at this time. First four years of his life he spent in Pharaoh's court. He learned in and out to the court of Pharaoh where he's going to go back and ask for the people of God to be released. Then he spent the second 40 years of his life in the wilderness. wilderness. Now where's he going to bring the people? When he brings them out of Egypt, he's going to bring them into the wilderness. So Moses is familiar with Pharaoh's court. And he's familiar with the wilderness. He's prepared and he doesn't even know it. God has been working in his life. God has been work, moving in his life. God has prepared him for this moment without him to even know him. The reality is this, that God is suited for a task more than Moses is. When God has something for us to do. He's suited for a task, not necessarily us. And he shoots down this excuse for two things. First of all, his presence. He says, certainly I will be with you. It comes with every command of God to do something. And that promise is only as good as the one who makes it. See, I could say to you, do what, do this because I will be with you. You need to ask the question, well, what can you do? My answer is, well, I can be with you. It's not just that God is with us, but all that God is and that all that God can do is with us when we say yes to him. Get that, really get that. All that God is and all that God can do is with us when we say yes to him. And then there's not only his presence, but there is promise. He says, you shall worship God at this mountain. Note the promises of God depend on the ability of God, not the ability of us. It's not going to be Moses who brings him to this mountain. It's going to be God who does it. What is required of us is to put our faith in what he's promised. The calls of God come with the presence and the promises of God. It's just that simple. God says, you will worship God at this mountain. Now, Moses doesn't see that. You know, I take God at his word. That's, where, that's what we do with the promises of God. We must take them at his word. The second excuse that Moses gives is, no one will believe me. He says in verse chapter 4, verse 1, and Moses said, what they will not believe me? Or listen to what I say. For they may say, you know, where is that? What might happen? You know, a lot of times what might happen never does happen. They could. They may say, the Lord has not appeared to you. The Lord said to him, what's that in your hand? He said, a staff, old shepherd's staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent. Moses fled from it. I don't know what kind of snake this is, but, but Moses has been 40 years in the wilderness. He's seen about every kind there is, and he runs from this one. The Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand, grasp it by its tail. So he stretched out his hand, caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. He said that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. A simple shepherd's staff. He said, throw it on the ground, then take it, pick it up by tail. I went to college in Brownwood, Texas, Howard Payne University, and every year they had a thing there, the Coliseum there called the Brownwood Coliseum. 
and a rattlesnake roundup where people would go out into the countryside and would catch rattlesnakes alive. They'd bring them back and they'd put them into the middle of this uh, coliseum. And then of all things, they'd have what they called a bagging contest where guys would go in there with a sack and they'd bag as many rattlesnakes as they could in a certain amount of time. I tell you, these are not normal people. These are not normal people do stuff like this. One thing you will notice if you go in there, and they will pick up one of those snakes by tail. Uh, they do have rattlesnakes snakes would come around, bite them, and release that venom that they're trying to capture for medicinal purposes. They always caught this snake right behind the head. And Moses has been in the wilderness for years. It's gotta be a strange request. Why, would God, why didn't God just say grab it? He said grasp it by its tail. Why did he say that? I don't know for sure. But, but I got this idea that he's, he's asking for Moses to be obedient. In the 70s, there was a Christian recording artist, Ken Medema or Medema, who had a song about this. And, and in the song, he has Moses having a conversation with God, and he says, he says God, we don't, you, you're not around here. We don't do this kind of thing around here. We, that's not what we do. We don't grab snakes by the tail. No, you don't. You don't. But he's doing it. I'm convinced. I'm convinced that if, he, if Moses had done what was natural and what they always did, if he grabbed it by his head, then it would just remain a snake. And when he grabbed it by tail, it became a staff again. The test was, would he obey? Don't misunderstand, God is not calling us to be the brightest and the bravest. He is simply calling us to obey him. And the success of this mission would be entirely dependent upon Moses being obedient to God. Amazing what a simple staff can do in the hands of one who does what calls him, God calls him to do. With this staff, Moses held out, held it out and parted the Red Sea that they passed through on dry ground. With his staff, Moses hit the rock and water came out of the rock to feed the entire, to water the entire company of Israel. With this staff, his victory, he had victory in warfare over the Malachites as Aaron and Hur held up his hands as they grew tired. Whatever you have to offer God can be a powerful source of victory. God doesn't need great things from you. He needs whatever you have to use, whatever you have, whatever way he tells you to use it. As long as it's in the hands of someone who says yes to God, there's amazing things that God will do. You don't need people to believe. You need people to trust in God. Finally, the third excuse Moses gives is, I can't do it. He says, Moses said to the Lord in verse 10 of chapter 4, Please, Lord, please, I've never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past, nor since you've spoken to your servant, for I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. The Lord said to him, Who's made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now then go. I will be with your mouth. I will teach you what you are to say. He said, Please, Lord, now send a message by whomever you will. Then the anger, of the anger of the Lord burned against Moses. Verse 10 is the excuse. I'm not an eloquent speaker, Lord. I got a speech problem. I haven't speak, spoken well in the past. I'm not speaking well now. And since you, since you called me, since you spoke to me, it hadn't gotten any better. Notice what God didn't say. Oh, I didn't know that, Moses. I'm sorry. If I'd known that, that you couldn't speak very well, I would have gone somewhere else, tried to get someone else. I just did not know that you were like that. No, no, God didn't say that. Verse 11 is God's answer to all excuses is why we can't do it. He says, I made your mouth. I made man mute or deaf or sing or blind. Is not I the Lord? Go, I will be with you. There is that presence again. I will teach you what you, what you want me. I will teach you what I want you to say. He knows our weakness. It's his strength and our weakness that brings glory to him. See, God simplifies things in verse 4. He says, go. I'll be with your mouth. I will teach you what to say. That's all there is to it. Go. I will be with your mouth. I will teach you what to say. See, God never said you could do it. Whatever he wants you to do, God never said you could do it and you cannot. He only said he could do it and he will. Well, when all excuses are thrown to window, you have only two choices. Moses said, send someone else. You know the problem with that? God personally chose you. He did. 
He didn't run that in the paper. He didn't ask for volunteers. He didn't put a listing on the bulletin board. He wants you. He wants you, no one else. He wants you. As Moses started out saying, here I am, which is a statement of availability, he should be still saying that. He should be saying, I'm here, do your will, your work. Excuses are not valid because God's work does not depend on our ability, only on our availability. And God doesn't let, let you off the hook either. He doesn't give up on you. He wants you. An example of that is Jonah. Jonah, God calls Jonah to go to Nineveh and share the, the message of repentance. He didn't want to go. So he, goes, he gets on a ship and goes the other way. You think God will just let him go and get someone else. No. God pursued Jonah. God pursued him the point that he had created a great fish to swallow him up, to get his attention. God wants you, this, when there's something he wants you to do, he's not going to give that job to anyone else, he's going to give it only to you. Moses, he's not going to send someone else. He didn't say, okay, Moses, I understand the situation, I'll send someone else. That's not what God says, that's not what he's going to do. Uh, that means if you don't do it, it's not going to get done. The reality is your lack of confidence is not a lack of confidence in your abilities. It's a lack of confidence in God's abilities. It really is. When God calls and He will, are you ready to say yes? Now, let me make some applications for us today. You're never qualified to do what God tells you to do. We really are nobodies. The importance is not us, but the mission does not depend upon our abilities, our talents, our creativity. This depends on being faithful to the mission. Second, so never consider your abilities in saying yes to God. Always consider His abilities because God is able to do anything. There's nothing God cannot do. There are plenty of people God could just do what He wants you, what He wants done, but that's not the issue. He wants you to do it. And don't try to reason out God's call or make sense of it. Just obey. Just do it. You know, Nike had that, had that phrase, just do it. But that's it. That's it. That's all. Just do what God calls you to do. God will be the ability. God will be the power. God will be the wisdom. God will do it all. He just wants to do it through you. Don't say send somewhere else. Don't say send someone else. Say, here I am. Send me. Send me. Here I am. I'll do it and God will be glorified, and you will be blessed. I hope you will. God bless you.